On February 14, 2017, the large pharmaceutical company Merck announced that they were stopping the phase three clinical trials of a new drug targeting Alzheimer's disease. The trials were stopped because the drug did not seem to have any positive effect. It did not help against the disease. And it's far from the first time this has happened. Indeed, in the last 14 years, no new major drugs have been approved for the treatment of Alzheimer's. The lack of a cure is not by lack of research efforts. But really, the first time I read a medical research paper in detail, I realized two things about experimental medical research. Now, this was a paper studying brain activity during sleep, and they were studying sleeping mice in particular. And the main author of this study had spent two years of her life teaching mice to fall asleep under a microscope. Just imagine that, two years teaching mice for one study. But until then, I don't think I'd realized how practically difficult experimental medical research can be. Now, the second thing I realized was a bit more, let's say, sinister. Now, these types of papers sometimes state that the mice were sacrificed after so and so many hours, after so and so many minutes. And it dawned on me then that medical research can be ethically difficult. And I understood how it can be today that there are even fundamental things that we do not know about the mouse brain and much more so about the human brain. But this complexity of traditional experimental and clinical approaches to medical research just begs the question. Could there be a different way to gain medical insight? Could there be an approach that could transcend these practical and ethical limitations? And if there was, what then? Now you imagine that you're in this situation where you have something, something precious. Think of a crystal vase, a really expensive crystal vase. And you need to experiment a bit on this, but you're terrified of it shattering into a million pieces. What do you do? Well, one thing you can do is to make a dummy or a model. A model is a representation of a person or a thing or a phenomenon. The model may not have all the features of the original. It may not be as detailed, it may not be as elaborate, it may not be as perfect. But the model must capture the essence of the original, the key features that make the original what it is. Models are in use everywhere. For instance, the car industry, they've been using crash test dummies since the 1950s. Because the beauty of having a model, you see, is that once you have it, you can practice on it. You can experiment on it. With a crash test dummy, they can test the effects of a car crash without it even happening. And if it's a good model, in the sense that the model captures enough features of the original, then what happens in the model will also happen in reality. A crash test dummy without a head or a neck would probably not be such a good model for testing whiplash injuries. But it might be a good model even if it lacks hair or eyelashes or forgot to put on makeup that day. In the context of medicine, in the context of human health and disease, that's something precious that we ideally would want to experiment on but can't afford to break is the human body. And what I want to make a model of, what I want to model, is how the body functions when healthy and how it dysfunctions in the case of disease. Or even more precisely, I want to make a mathematical model of a physiological process, of an action, of something that happens inside your body. One example could be the single beat of a heart, which is driven by tiny electrical sparks spreading throughout it. Or in that medical study I referred to earlier, where they injected dye into and were studying sleeping, anim, sleeping mice, they very carefully injected dye into the brains of those sleeping mice in order to see how it would spread. So that would be an example of another physiological process, the spreading of dye 
or more generally the spreading of oxygen or protein fragments in brain tissue. And this is an inter interesting physiological process because we know that in diseases like Alzheimer's, protein fragments tend not to spread nicely but rather lump together and create havoc. Mathematical models are not physical models like a crash test dummy. Mathematical models are abstract models posed as equations. An equation is a relation between something that's known and something that's not, an unknown. And when I solve the equation, I compute the unknown from the known information using a fixed set of rules and operations that everyone agrees on. When creating a mathematical model of a physiological process, the known bits are the things that are possible to observe and to measure, while the unknowns are the things that one cannot. So what are things that are, well, relatively easy to measure? Well, anything exterior on your outside of your body is pretty easy to access. And generally, shapes and sizes, even the shape of your heart and the shape of your brain can be mapped using medical imaging. What the unknowns are typically depend on the process. If one is modeling the heart, the unknown could be the electrical signal which is present in every cell in your heart during every heartbeat. Or when modeling the spread of dye in brain tissue, the unknown could be the movement of water in and around the brain cells. The water will carry the dye, but it's actually impossible to measure the movement of water itself. But this leaves us with one missing piece, the link between the knowns and the unknowns. But fortunately, this is where the basic laws of physics come to our rescue. These are the laws that state that energy does not appear out of nowhere, that matter does not vanish in thin air, and that movement does not start or stop without a force. Mathematics then provides us with the language to express these laws in the form of equations. So that is what a mathematical model is. It's an abstract representation of a process or a phenomenon which couples nature's governing laws on the one hand with known information on the other. This it's a mathematical model of dye spreading in brain tissue. It's called the diffusion equation. And isn't it beautiful? <laughs> There's just seven simple symbols there. But those seven simple symbols can represent this incredibly complex physiological process. This is a computer simulation of the same mathematical model which you can think of as a realization of the model or as the output from the model with given measurements as input. Much in the same way as crash test dummies allow us to experiment with different car crash scenarios, mathematical models allow us to experiment with and make predictions for changing conditions. For instance, this mathematical model would allow us to experiment with different brain scenarios. By changing properties of the tissue on the brain within the model, we can ask and answer what if type questions. What if the brain is not an average brain, but the younger brain, the brain of a child? What if it's an older brain? What if it's an older brain with Alzheimer's symptoms? But much unlike crash test dummies, mathematical models have no physical limitations. So this means that we can create and experiment with scenarios that are not even possible to create in real life. And in contrast to crash test dummies, which may cost hundreds of thousands of US dollars, and in contrast to clinical trials, which may cost tens of millions of US dollars, this mathematical model is free, it's available to all, and the only cost to realize it is the cost of the computer power needed. Let's look at a different mathematical model. So this is a model of the electrical signal propagating through your heart roughly every second, every day, every year of your life. 
And in a study published last year, researchers from Johns Hopkins University combined computer simulations of precisely this model with medical images of individual patients' hearts. And their results showed that the model could predict each individual patient's risk of future heart rhythm disturbances better than any existing clinical metric. So perhaps in the next 14 years, this mathematical approach will give us new therapies for Alzheimer's disease. So to me, the appeal of mathematics is not a number magic or tricky puzzles in the newspaper. To me, the real beauty of mathematics is how it provides us with this simple language, but with endless possibilities for describing, for understanding, and for improving the world around us and the world within us. Thank you.